1,000 years ago, Scotland has just emerged from the Dark Ages. At home, tensions and rivalries threaten to rip it apart, outsiders to take it over. But now, in 2020, Scotland is a strong nation and a global player. Scotland is one of the oldest nations in Europe. The saltire is one of the oldest flags in the world. It takes up a third of mainland Britain, but with just one-tenth of its population. And yet this astonishing country has always punched above its weight. Scottish ideas and ingenuity have shaped our planet in dramatic ways. With the possible exception of the ancient Greeks, no other small country can compare with Scotland in terms of impact on human benefit. In its centuries-old love-hate relationship with England, this little kingdom has always stood firm. England could easily defeat Scotland in battle, but it couldn't hold Scotland. Scottish dynamism was at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. Scotland is the most advanced industrial society in the world by the 1850s. Scottish scientists helped invent the modern world. Fundamentally, Maxwell makes modern physics possible. And Scotland has always played a crucial role in Britain's global history too. We make these discoveries of North Sea oil, which ultimately underwrites the economy for the next 50 years. Brutal, bloody, inspiring, and most of all surprising, this is the story of Scotland, 1,000 years of history. Ten centuries ago, Scotland had only just been born. Before that, it was a very different place. For a start, it's known as Alba, and it's a patchwork of different regions and peoples. You have the Scots, the Scotty, and of course the Scotty, to confuse things, uh, are from Ireland. The other sort of kind of main grouping that you have are the Picty, and you also have a group of sort of kind of Strathclyde Britons who speak a kind of form of Welsh. And then around the edges, uh, you also have Vikings. A thousand years ago, these four peoples have coalesced into a single kingdom. Scotland at that time is a very different sort of kind of Scotland from what we would now sort of kind of see. Uh, they speak a different language, um, or languages. But by 1018, the kings of Scotland had established the border on the Tweed. After the defeat of the English by William the Conqueror, Norman knights came to Scotland too, to work as mercenaries. They strengthened the Scottish monarchy and created noble links that crossed the border to England and France. There were occasional dust-ups, but the two countries seemed to be growing together. Contrary to popular belief, and you won't believe this, but it's true, the relationship between Scotland and England in the mid-13th century was extremely good. I mean, really good. The societies are really very close. But then fate took a hand. Alexander III is King of Scotland. His brother-in-law, Edward I, sits on the English throne. But in 1286, Alexander dies, and his heir shortly after. Scotland finds itself without a monarch. And that presents a huge problem, because in the Middle Ages, it's God that chooses kings. And, but he doesn't tend to get that involved with the process. So who is going to make that decision? The Scottish nobility invite the English king, Edward I, to decide. Effectively, what Edward does, as any monarch at that time would do, is sort of see that as an opportunity to expand his kingdom. Edward picks a man he thinks he can control, John Balliol. But Edward's insistence Scots recognise the English crown as superior is unpopular. And when Edward goes to war with France, Scots seize their chance. So Edward starts a war with France and Balliol takes this as an opportunity as he sees it to ally with France. This pact is the old alliance. 
an agreement between Scotland and France. Edward is furious. The reaction of Edward is pretty ferocious. Edward invades Scotland. In 1296, Edward commits atrocities across Scotland, beats the Scots at Dunbar, and ritually humiliates Balliol. Balliol is, is deposed and removed, and an English administration is intruded into Scotland in 1296. The brutality of the English invasion and the humiliation of their king kindles Scottish resistance. With rebellion brewing, in 1297, one of Scotland's most famous sons steps forward, William Wallace. William Wallace, yes. Well, have, a postcard might be about right for what we know about William Wallace. We know nothing, really, about who he was prior to the moment when he hits the historical scene by murdering the Sheriff of Lanark in 1297. When rebellion spreads across Scotland, Wallace becomes a leader. In the summer of 1297, he drives the English out of Fife and Perthshire. Edward orders a large English army northwards. The forces can only meet at one place. If you look at an ancient map, you can see that Scotland is almost two islands. You can't get from the south to the north without going through Stirling. Despite his successes, Wallace must be worried. He's facing a bigger army, which has more heavy cavalry. English and French heavy cavalry uh, were the key arm for medieval warfare. Wallace knew the power of heavy cavalry. Just a year before, the Battle of Dunbar had been decided by a single charge. The typical cavalry charge might involve about a front of around 2,000 tons moving into the enemy at almost 20, 20 to 25 miles an hour. That's an enormous impact for any body of foot soldiers to withstand, and typically they didn't withstand it. At the crossing, the River Forth dramatically loops. The only way across is a narrow wooden bridge that would allow only two knights to cross at a time. The Scots are on the north bank, about a mile from the bridge. To the south of the river, the English commander orders his men across. So the Scots? it has been argued, are supposed to let the English come over, line up and beat them. That's what it says in the rule book, that's chivalric. But of course, they're going to let enough men come over uh, to make it worth, you know, their while actually calling it a battle, uh, but not so many that they're going to be uh, a problem for the Scots. Once the English have some troops on the north bank, the Scots suddenly charge. Boxed in by the river, the English find that they've walked into a trap with only a tiny bridge as an escape route. Basically, it is a massacre. Um, they attack the, the horses coming over, and then there are all these men on the bridge who can't move, and so a lot of them jump into the forth, but with heavy armour, they drown. We can be sure that uh, a very large portion of the English army were killed. Against the odds, William Wallace wins a legendary victory. But his success is short-lived. A year later, at the Battle of Falkirk, Wallace's army clashes with one led by the king himself. Wallace continues to fight for another six years, desperate to find allies. He's been involved for several years in trying to maintain Scottish diplomatic relationships with the continent. But in 1304, the Scottish nobility cut a deal with Edward for peace. Edward forgives the nobles who fought for Scottish independence, but not Wallace. He's captured in 1305, and Edward shows no mercy. And he's executed by being hanged, castrated, have his, uh, his entrails burnt in front of his eyes while he's dying, and then chopped into four parts, plus his head. A year after Wallace's grisly death, a Scottish noble who took Edward's deal manoeuvres in an attempt to become the new King of Scotland, Robert the Bruce. Bruce is much more difficult, problematic than Wallace is. Wallace is easy because he was so consistent. It was very, uh, it's very simple to see what he was fighting for. Bruce, you always have that suspicion that he's fighting for himself, which he is. 
1306, Edward I is ailing, and Scottish nobles see a chance to reinstall a Scottish king. Robert is in the running, but impatiently takes matters into his own hands and dispatches one of his rivals for the throne. He removes Balliol's right-hand man, the Red Cumming, by sort of kind of doing him in in a church, and he's subsequently excommunicated by the Pope for this. Even so, Bruce is crowned king. There is war immediately with the English forces in Scotland, and Bruce is seriously and immediately defeated. If you want a very genuine story of an utter transformation, Robert Bruce is your man, because in the first sort of year of his reign, so from his inauguration in March uh, 1306, he was rubbish. Bruce retreats into the wilderness with his few remaining allies. Here, he undergoes a remarkable transformation. I don't know what he did. He came back a new man. I mean, totally different. He's not going to play by the rules. You know, all this upbringing, you know, the chivalric upbringing, out the window now. Edward I dies in 1307. His son, Edward II, makes peace with Scotland. But Bruce wages a brutal guerrilla war against anyone opposing him. So he has to defeat both Scots forces and English forces to unite Scotland behind him. And he does this absolutely consistently between 1308 and 1314. He does nothing but win victories. By 1314, most Scots have sworn loyalty to Bruce and Edward II invades, but he doesn't have his father's genius. Edward II was not as incompetent as he is portrayed in Braveheart, but there is no doubt that he was a mediocre military leader. Even so, Edward II has a much bigger army. The two sides meet in a place that has come to symbolise the fight for Scottish independence, Bannockburn. There are about 15,000 infantry and maybe 3,000 heavy cavalry in the English feudal army, and there are about six to 7,000 Scots. But Bruce has developed tactics to deal with the cavalry. The cavalry get into problems uh, fairly quickly because there's a huge number of them in, in a small space. Uh, Bruce has laid booby traps in the ground. Quite a lot of the ground is soft. Bruce's tightly packed spearmen known as Shiltrums, then do something unheard of. Normally they would be used in a defensive way. Robert actually sort of kind of uses them offensively. We have three, three Shiltrums are all pressing back against the heavy cavalry, and eventually uh, the, the English forces give way and they start drowning in the Bannock Burn. The English flee. Robert the Bruce boots the English out of Scotland, consolidates his power, and cements his reputation. Robert is very effective. He's trained from birth to be a knight. He has determination. He has a, um, a self-centeredness. Um, we would probably describe him probably as a bit of a psychopath or a sociopath. Bruce caps his military success with diplomacy. In 1320, an appeal he sends to the Pope details English aggression and gives a full-throated declaration of Scottish independence. As long as but a hundred of us remain alive, never will we be brought under English rule. It is in truth not for glory, but for freedom, for that alone which no honest man gives up, but with life itself. The Pope demands Edward make peace and in 1328, a peace treaty is signed in which England recognises Scotland's sovereignty. The period from 1296 to 1328 marks the start of the Wars of Independence, wars that helped shape Scottish identity. Scotland remembers the Wars of Independence, and of course they weren't called that at the time, because there hadn't been this attempt to completely take over Scotland. And so it did a great deal to crystallise Scottish identity. 
Under Robert the Bruce's rule, Scotland shows it's not subject to its southern neighbour. It's a proud, unified nation that won't be beaten. England could easily defeat Scotland in battle, but it couldn't occupy, it couldn't hold Scotland. And that is important to the Scots and their sort of kind of sense of themselves. Now Scotland has forged a kingdom and identity, it is determined to keep it. But how will it do so with a much larger, richer, and more powerful neighbour to the south? During their thousand year history, Scots have had to fight fiercely for their independence. When Robert the Bruce dies in 1329, he hands to his son a united, independent kingdom of Scotland. But religion and royal intrigues will threaten that unity in the centuries ahead. Robert's son, David II, dies without a male heir, and the crown passes to Robert II in 1371, the first of a long line of Stuart kings. They actually keep the kingdom together and they stop England uh, from actually sort of kind of taking over. The second thing that they, they, they do, which is, is, is quite important, is that they start to connect themselves into Europe. The Stuart kings use diplomatic marriages into European royalty to keep the old alliance going. But this royal line faces crisis in 1542 when James V dies, leaving his 60-year-old baby to inherit the throne, Mary, Queen of Scots. It's not a great future was projected for her. And you can understand why. I mean, uh, Scotland uh, in the, the 16th century early 16th century is very volatile. Um, you've got continuing terrible relationship with England. And they would be looking at this wee lassie and thinking, how in heaven's name is she going to manage that? There were many candidates for Mary's hand and even a war, but eventually the old alliance won out and she was married to the King of France's heir, the Dauphin, Francis. She was dispatched to France, leaving her mother, Mary of Guise, to rule Scotland, supported by French troops. Mary's future seems assured. Queen of Scotland and future Queen of France. Enough to rattle England's Elizabeth I about the safety of her northern border. But a new religious movement sweeping Europe will change all that. The Reformation. The Reformation was a religious, uh, social and political conflict that spread across Europe in the century after 1517. The Reformation is basically the idea that, that the Catholic Church had become corrupt. Protestant reformers want to end the corruption. Scottish Protestants develop Presbyterianism. They not only want to end corruption, but they also want rid of the Catholic hierarchy of priests, bishops and popes. There is no hierarchy. There's no intercessory between you and God. Um, as long as you have a a belief in God and a truly repentant heart, you have this direct connection to God. The movement convulses Europe for centuries, but in 1558, Protestant Queen Elizabeth I ascends to the English throne. And as Mary's grandmother was Henry VIII's sister, she can claim Elizabeth's throne, which the French relish. They can say legitimately, this is someone who is entitled to the English throne. And because Elizabeth I is, is Protestant, she's not recognised by the other heads of Europe. And so whoever marries Mary can say, I have a legitimate Queen of England here, and we're going to push that claim, and we're going to use military force and the force of the church to, to take it. Elizabeth has to act, and events in Scotland offer an opportunity. Mary of Guise, Mary's Catholic mother, rules in her absence. But as the ideas of Protestantism spread in Scotland, she faces increasing resistance. So what you get is a group of lords, known as the Lords of the Congregation, who are anti-French, who want to take back control of the Scottish government for themselves, but who are also interested in the Protestant religion. Ultimately what happens is that in 1559, they begin a rebellion against Mary de Guise's governance of Scotland. The French send troops to Scotland to help Mary quell resistance. 
But Elizabeth sends a fleet to aid the Protestant lords. What's decisive about the English intervention is that they blockade the port of Leith and they effectively cut off Mary de Guise's ability to resupply her own troops. Um, that and the death of Mary de Guise in the, the summer of 1560 are, I would say, probably the two decisive things that help the lords of the congregation sway the war in their favour. 1560 is Mary's Annus Horribilis. Her mother dies. Scotland is in the hands of Protestant lords. Then her husband, the King of France, Francis II, dies. She is just 18. Once destined to be Queen of Scotland, France and England, Mary's future is uncertain. Hoping she can defeat the Lords of Congregation and sway Scotland back to Catholicism, in 1561, the French sent her home. She comes back to Scotland that is completely unrecognisable to the one that she had left. And culturally, she's very changed as well. Um, she's now French, effectively. She's Catholic. She comes back to a Scotland that is hardline Protestant, that is very patriarchal in terms of its government. Aged 19, queen of a country whose language she doesn't speak and facing a hostile nobility, Mary's got her work cut out. But she's not to be underestimated. She negotiates quite a clever financial settlement with the Protestant Kirk. She also maintains a balanced, relatively balanced, privy council. Um, something like ten Protestant courtiers to four Catholic ones. But there's that great elephant in the room. The one that Queen Elizabeth in England is wrestling with and which Mary is also wrestling with. She does not have a child. To have an heir, Mary must remarry. And that's where her troubles begin. Now, the marriage of a queen is a hugely controversial issue. Does she marry abroad and give that power authority over Scotland? If she marries internally to Scotland, then she's going to annoy all the rest of her nobility who didn't get to marry her. So it is a real can of worms. But she does manage to pick the worst of the whole bunch. Henry Lord Darnley is, you know, a complete well, he's just awful. Darnley was a complete idiot and was a huge, huge liability. He was 19 years old. He was rumoured to be a heavy drinker. He was rumoured also to already be harbouring an STD. In 1566, Mary has a son with Darnley, who will become James VI. Darnley shows little interest and moves out. But Darnley is a liability for Mary and needs to be dealt with. In the early hours of 10th of February 1567, there's a huge explosion heard across Edinburgh and it rocks the whole city. And when they go to the, the rubble of the, of the building, they find Darnley's body outside, um, not touched by the fire, but strangled and partially clothed, along with the body of one of his servants. Now, who did it is one of the great murder mysteries of Scottish history, but all fingers really pointed to the Earl of Bothwell. Just three months later, Mary marries Bothwell, the man implicated in Darnley's murder. When that happens, um, the Scottish nobility turn on them. 26 Scottish nobles, known as the Confederate Lords, raise an army against Mary and beat her. She's then taken and imprisoned in Loch Leven, and her son, James VI, is crowned as King of Scotland at the end of July 1567, after she's forced to abdicate. In 1568, Mary escapes her prison, tries and fails to recapture her throne, and then does the unthinkable. She then flees to England and straight into the arms of Elizabeth. She believes that this woman, who is a distant kinswoman, a, a, a fellow female monarch, will have some sympathy and understanding of her plight, how wrong she is. Mary is imprisoned by her cousin, whose throne she once claimed. After almost 20 years in prison, Mary is accused of plotting against Queen Elizabeth. In the end, Elizabeth cannot afford to have her alive and, and is, she is executed. And, and I don't think Elizabeth had much choice. Several hundred attend the execution. Facing death, Mary is an unrepentant Catholic and shows some French style. 
her execution in 1587 when she famously throws off her black dress to reveal the scarlet robes of a martyr. Um, even though that's a tightly controlled situation, she is able to steer it and create a great set piece with it. She forgives her executioner, prays in Latin. It takes several blows to behead her. When her head falls, it reveals she wore a wig. Her dog, found huddled in her dress, refuses to leave her body. It's a miserable end for someone who once could have been one of the most powerful women in Europe. She is one of these tragic figures of history where the, the, the situation in which she found herself was much, much bigger than she was equipped to deal with. Mary's son, King James VI of Scotland, is tutored by George Buchanan, a man who gave evidence that led to Mary's execution. Buchanan beats the young king and makes it clear he was no fan of his executed mother. I think one of the things you have to do is imagine what it would be like sort of kind of growing up as the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and the, the person who is teaching you was the person who made the, sort of kind of the, the legal case that your mother was a whore and a tyrant and deserved to be put to death. In one respect, Mary has the final say. In 1603, Elizabeth I dies childless. Mary's son, James, becomes the new king of England and Scotland. Mary doesn't ever get to see the throne of England, but of course, Mary's only son, James VI, um, does become the first king of a united British Isles. He is the first king of what eventually becomes Great Britain. As king, James destroys the castle where his mother was executed. He exhumes her body and has it buried in Westminster, opposite Elizabeth's. James is the first monarch to rule over both kingdoms. From now on, Scotland's destiny will be linked to England, but it is far from a united kingdom, and the political shocks will be felt for centuries. In 1603, after nearly 600 years of Scottish history, the Scottish King James VI becomes James I of England. But the two kingdoms are not united. Each still has its own parliament, legal system and church. There are even customs to be paid on trade between the two countries. And for James, there is another problem. In Scotland itself, clan battles and tensions between the Highlands and Lowlands is never far away. Back in the 1300s, Scotland's distinct geography was the same. Hilly and mountainous, highland in the north and west, rolling hills and flatland in the lowland south and east. Nobody really thought of Highlanders. All of Scotland was in many respects more similar because Scotland has, uh, has been a, always been a compound of um, Irish Gaelic landholding and English feudal landholding practices. And then what happened is that some of it became more modern in, say, the 14th or 15th century. What we think of as the lowlands changed more quickly than society. What we think of as the highlands changed. The remote highland areas favour cattle and tend to be Gaelic speaking. Lowland areas tend to have good agricultural land and people who speak Scots or English. And as the lowlands modernise, some lowlanders start to imagine a cultural difference. They very much stress the settled, arable, agricultural producing uh, lowlander who is law abiding, you know, and productive. Whereas the highlander, you know, is moving around with his animals. He's much more lawless. In reality, the division was never so neat but the Highlands do have a more militaristic culture. This, and the remoteness of the territory, means royal power is limited. So the Highlands, um, by the late med medieval period, it is true, it is much more militarised than the Lowlands. They speak a different language, they are, seem culturally different, and the kings of Scots never really get to grips with them. When King James sees the problem, he tries to tackle it head on. He demands Highland chiefs send their sons to the Lowlands to learn English, the first steps in an erosion of Highland culture. And now he has moved to London 
a power vacuum emerges in Scotland. After James goes to England, there's a gap. And into that gap, in terms of national identity, points of loyalty, political focus, it is increasingly filled by religion. Scottish Presbyterians believe no one stands between them and their God, including the King. It was passionate, committed, intense and uncompromising religious lobby. They wouldn't be governed by bishops and indeed, as it turned out, by kings either. Like kings and queens before, both James and his son, Charles I, believe God has given them the right to absolute rule. In 1637, Charles tries introducing religious reforms to Scotland. He introduces the English prayer book. It causes a riot in St Giles Cathedral when it's first introduced. Charles's dispute with Scottish Presbyterians deepens to the point where he sends an army to Scotland. Charles says, right, we'll bring the Scots into line. That starts off the Bishops' Wars, in which the Scots defeat the English and occupy Newcastle. It's a political catastrophe for Charles. And as a result, in 1642, the Civil War breaks out in England after the Scots defeat Charles' army in the Second Bishops' War, pitting King against Parliament in both countries. For years, the British Isles are torn apart in bloody conflict. When the Royalists finally lose in 1649, Charles is beheaded. Despite the restoration of his son in 1660, the Stuart tendency to absolutism meant by 1690, the Dutch Protestant William of Orange sits on the thrones of Scotland and England. The Jacobites made famous most recently by the Outlander series, uh, believed in the restoration of James and his direct descendants to the thrones of England, Scotland and Ireland. From 1689, there are several Jacobite attempts to restore the Scottish Stuart kings to the throne. The most successful was led by a man whose face now adorns shortbread biscuit tins everywhere. Bonnie Prince Charlie. Charles Edward Stuart was born uh, at the end of 1720. He's the grandson of James VII of Scotland and II of England. He finances a private operation to come to Scotland with a few hundred members of the Irish brigades and some senior Jacobites to start a rising. In the mid-18th century, it was still possible for a Highland chief to call members of his clan to arms. That and the Highlands' remoteness is why Charles lands there in 1745. So those few troops he brought with him had to go home because there was a sea battle and one of the two ships he came in had to return to France. Charles lands with just seven men. About half of them are really completely past it. Um, they are, by the 18th century standards, old men. The Highland chiefs are expecting a large French army and to begin with, they just sort of look at him and go, what the heck do you expect us to do with this? No, don't be silly, off you go. Despite his setbacks, Bonnie Prince Charlie raises a Jacobite army in Scotland and marches south. By 1745, the British crown had passed to George II of the House of Hanover. He sends an army north. The forces meet at Preston Pans and the Jacobites smash the Royalists. Charlie's army presses on and gets as far south as Derby. At Derby, finally, promises of French help, English recruitment, they all seem to uh, have not been fulfilled and Charles is losing credibility. Charlie is forced to retreat to Scotland. King George sends his son, Prince William, Duke of Cumberland, north to hunt Charlie's army down. The two armies finally meet at Culloden Moor, east of Inverness. There were about four and a half to 5,000 Scottish troops, but they mainly fought in the front line because they were hoping to carry the day by a shock attack. So it was all or nothing. The British army outnumbered the Jacobites by almost two to one, and it had got much superior cavalry. It was the cavalry who charged that enabled 
a rapid victory for the British forces that day. The Jacobites are defeated in just 40 minutes. Charlie flees to Europe and Stuart hopes of a restoration die in the Highlands. The men he leaves behind face terrible retribution. The next day, uh, basically, uh, execution squads were sent round to do, finish off the wounded deliberately and large-scale cutting down of civilians on the road to Inverness. Approximately three times as many Jacobites died in the next couple of days as they died in the battle itself. They weren't really asking, you know, a lot of questions about who was innocent and guilty necessarily. A lot of uh, Highlanders were, were executed. In Scotland, in the months following the battle, there is First of all, a clear policy of terrorising, burning crops, driving people off. There is a lot of arbitrary killing. Cumberland is dubbed the Butcher. The British government sees the Highlands as a place of uncertain loyalty with a military culture and mounts a PR campaign against Highlanders. Jacobitism shouldn't be seen as a purely Highlander clan phenomenon. It wasn't but it suited the British government to paint it in that light. Clans were associated with being backward, barbaric, speaking a different language. So by focusing on the Highland element, the British government was trying, in a sense, to delegitimise Jacobitism. The government resolves to wipe out the social, cultural and military structure of the Highland clans. New laws ban weapons, bagpipes and even Highland dress but it also led to what one government spokesman called the undressing of those savages, namely tartanry uh, and the kilt. Tartan is seen as a sort of emblem of Jacobitism, um, and it's seen as a sort of symbol they've got to try and root out. Um, the legal powers of the chiefs are dismantled, and what you're doing there is robbing them of the sort of um, official power structures which kept the clans as cohesive, political and military units. An entire way of life, already under pressure from modernisation, teeters on extinction. But the growing British Empire offers some Highlanders opportunity. When Britain is stretched during a big war against France, um, Britain turns to the Highlands for manpower. Now that's crucial because it begins the process of what we would describe as the rehabilitation of the figure of the Highlander. The bagpipes become a part of um, the British Army. Uh, the Highland dress becomes uh, a part of the, the British Army. And what you're seeing effectively is the turning of former rebels into loyal redcoats. Um, but what's really interesting, it's done with at least a symbolic nod to um, the elements of, of Highland culture, which have been prominent during the Jacobite era. So they can retain their bagpipes, they can retain their kilts, they can retain uh, their broadswords. At the same time, artists and writers start to romanticise the Highlander. In 1822, King George visits Scotland, the first monarch to do so since 1651. He attends an event in Edinburgh. It's organised by Sir Walter Scott, and what he does is he Highlandises it uh, to give the monarchy a kind of distinctive Scottish dimension. King George the nephew of the butcher, Cumberland, arrives in a spectacular tartan outfit. He turns in a, a mini kilt with pink tights, and he was fairly corpulent, so it, it, it probably was not the best sort of sartorial matching. And he's addressed as the chief of the chiefs. This uh, romantic image of the Highlander, aided and abetted by the novels of Sir Walter Scott, uh, and, uh, and others, the new awareness that the hill country of the Highlands was actually, was an, actually an, an attractive area. Scotland opens up for tourists. The English now, you know, they're flocking to the Highlands. It's, it's, it, it's the place to go. Um, and you get, everybody comes up, you know, William Wordsworth and his, his sister Dorothy. And, and the Highlands have been appropriated uh, for people who, who are prepared to view it nostalgically. The absolute apogee of this is Queen Victoria, who falls in love with the Highlands when she comes up with Albert on her honeymoon. Victoria builds Balmoral, her idealised view of Scotland, 
Noble Highlanders sporting tartan kilts helps ingrain this vision of Scotland across the empire. And to an extent, Scots embrace it. It helps define them from their increasingly powerful southern neighbour. Some of the most recognisable Scottish clichés come from a culture that was demonised, faced the brink of extinction, then idolised. But although it only ever represented part of Scotland, a country with a history far richer than any cliché, the taste for Highland tartanry is a symbol that in the turmoil of the previous centuries, a new nation has emerged, the United Kingdom of Great Britain. But who will pay the price for unity? When, after 600 years of Scottish history, Scotland's James VI becomes King of England, the two countries remain separate, and nowhere more so than over the question of trade. In the 13th century, Scottish traders are making connections in Europe from the Baltics to Flanders, trading in fish, timber and wool. It is a small northern European kingdom. Um, its links really tend to be primarily across the North Sea. Over the centuries, Scotland and France are close. Scottish soldiers fight alongside Joan of Arc, and up until the Reformation of Scotland, look to France as its main ally, with the European mainland the destination for most of its trade. After the Reformation and the Union of the Crowns, Scotland then looks more to England for trade. But by the 17th century, there's a new kid on the block. The Dutch are the, the, the sort of the, the wonder of, of Europe in the, in the 17th century. They are, they're just really, really good, efficient traders. Scotland develops close ties to the Netherlands. They're Protestant and they're establishing a very successful trading empire. So when England's expanding empire comes into competition with France and the Netherlands, there's trouble. The result is then a series of conflicts or bits of trade legislation which, which make the selling of Scottish goods in this North Sea world increasingly difficult. And that led many people to, 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 to argue that because trade suffered, they should have free trade with England. But English merchants resist free trade with Scotland. If England gives an open trade relationship to Scotland, it is in effect letting the Netherlands in the back door. English laws protect the English economy at the expense of the Scots. Scotland watches enviously as other European nations set up lucrative trading posts and colonies, not least England. But by the end of the 17th century, Scots have had enough and the Darien scheme is born. So the Darien venture is Scotland's um, attempt at establishing its own colony on the Isthmus of Panama, where Panama is at its narrowest and, and it's more or less where you find the, um, the Panama Canal these days. It will give access to the Atlantic and the Pacific. So it's this great grand utopian scheme for giving Scotland access to the two great oceans of the world. You can carry goods over land um, and, and really make the trade from east to west, from west to east, much quicker. In 1695, the Company of Scotland trading to Africa and the Indies is set up by the Scottish Parliament and is open to investors. It's immediately put under pressure. The English really do not like the idea of having such a potential competitor right next door and, and, and the potential for harm to the English Empire really is significant. This leads to a kind of patriotic rallying in Scotland, where many Scots invest in the company. In July 1698, five ships carrying 1,200 colonists leave Leith docks and travel thousands of miles to Darien. They arrive in November and run into trouble. When they arrive, it turns out to be really quite a, a hostile environment. Um, it's a swamp. That's going to mean uh, mosquitoes and malaria. The result is you have major diseases and fevers. 
the bonnets and some of the other winter clothes that they packed um, are, are, are not really what they need. Despite appeals, William, king of both England and Scotland, refuses to help the Scots in Darien, because Darien is also claimed by his ally, Spain. You would expect the King of Scots to back the Company of Scotland, but as King of England, his strategic priorities are to keep Spain on side. In that position, the King is always going to choose what works best for England. The king issues a number of edicts which, which stipulate that Scots are not to be helped along the way. English governors in uh, the other side of the Atlantic, in places like Jamaica or, 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 the, or the mainland colonies, are told not to help. They're to deny the Scots, uh, uh, in a sense, assistance. Darien really is, um, has, has a big impact on Scotland. It's, it, it becomes a, a, a trauma. 3,750 Scots set out for Darien, but only a handful return. Scotland's colonial ambitions die, and there's an economic fallout. One of the big popular myths about Darien is that it bankrupts Scotland as a nation. That's not really a strictly accurate way of seeing it. Um, it meant that large numbers of private investors were almost certainly in major trouble. The Scots in question are the political and commercial elite of Scotland. Um, their line will be, um, if I'm bankrupt to all intents and purposes, the country is bankrupt. In 1706, England, at war in Europe and in need of domestic security, is negotiating a union between the two kingdoms. She sees opportunities in the union and the distress of the bankrupted Scots elite weakens the Scottish side. England is very well aware of the potential that lies in Scotland. Scots have important trade links around Europe. Um, England needs more manpower um, for its, its increasing um, English empire. Um, and uh, so it's in, in many ways, it's after Scotland's resources. And England has a lot to gain by, by the Union. In the negotiations of 1706, the English Crown agrees to use taxpayers' money as compensation, then that helps create the sense that Scotland is gaining something meaningful from the negotiations. And in a sense, it helps probably um, lubricate par the Scottish Parliament's uh, acceptance of the Union. In 1707, a treaty is signed between Scotland and England. It's the birth of Great Britain, that the two kingdoms of Scotland and England shall upon the first day of May next, ensuing the date hereof and forever after, be united into one kingdom by the name of Great Britain. Scotland loses its parliament, but Scots now sit in Westminster and trade with England and its burgeoning empire is finally open to them. They grab the opportunity with both hands. So the union doesn't give Scotland access to the whole of the empire, it gives it access to half of the empire. But it meant free trade and navigation in what you would describe as the Atlantic Empire. Scots already had links with the Americas. Now many Glasgow-based merchants ramp up their trade with the colonies. The best example of this, of course, is the exploitation by Glasgow merchants of tobacco. The result is by the 1720s, English ports are already noticing that Glasgow and Glasgow merchants are out competing them. By the 1720s, Scots' control of British tobacco imports was already sizeable and starting to seriously grow and Scotland's European links are paying off. Scotland, and particularly the Glasgow merchants, are importing so much tobacco, it can't be consumed inside Scotland. It's being re-exported in vast amounts, particularly to large markets in the Netherlands, but above all in France. In a way, um, Glasgow, is its new role is to give lung cancer to large numbers of European smokers. Scots find a way of getting more profits from each shipment, not least because ships sailing from Glasgow can arrive in the New World two or three weeks earlier than the competition. By 1772 to 74, Glasgow was the largest trading uh, tobacco port anywhere in the British Empire. In the 18th century, Scottish merchants in Glasgow reap huge profits. The tobacco lords build themselves opulent houses in the countryside 
and grand buildings in Glasgow. But they also reinvest money, slowly building the Scottish economy. Merchant families invest in land and also invest in industrial activity in the west of Scotland. Everything from sugar manufacturers right through to cotton mills were supported financially by families engaged in the transatlantic trade. From tobacco, Glasgow merchants move on to trading in sugar, then cotton, and Scotland reaps the rewards. The wealth and power of the tobacco lords is getting reinvested into ironworks, textiles. But as with the English merchants, there is a brutal legacy. They talk about the tobacco lords, but they didn't say much about who picked the tobacco. Glasgow had a tremendous link with America in terms of slave-grown tobacco. Tobacco, sugar, cotton, they could not have existed on any, on any scale without the employment of chattel slave labourer. Some of its trading wealth has been built on blood and suffering. During the Napoleonic Wars, 80% of Scottish imports and exports by value in that period were based on these two slave-produced commodities of tobacco and sugar. From 1707, in the Union, by the time slavery ended, Scotland was transformed from a poor country in Europe to one of the richest. Did slavery make Scotland rich? And the answer is yes. Now there are calls to take down the statues and street names that memorialise the slave owners of Glasgow and Edinburgh. History helps us to change our views. And if we therefore remove these street names and and statues, then, you know, we, we will keep those views. The point is what we should do is to put plaques on statues saying exactly what, in fact, these people did. <laughs>